the broadcast ministry of Christ Way Fellowship brings you victory for today. Exalting the Savior, evangelizing the seeker, and equipping the saint. Committed to the principle that you can have victory today and every day through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And now, here's your host, Pastor Wayne Duncan. Well, hello, friends, and welcome to Victory for Today. I was born again in 1974, the latter part of that year, November, committed my life to Christ. And uh, the next year, there was a movie that came out, and that movie was produced by the Billy Graham organization. I think they are worldwide pictures. And that movie was a biography or a biographical movie uh, about a family in Holland and particularly about one member of that family. The lady's name was Corey Ten Boom. <laughs> now, I know a lot of folks have, have never really heard that name before, but I want to tell you that if you have never seen that movie, The Hiding Place, or read the book, The Hiding Place, I just uh, urge you to do that. The Ten Boom family was uh, a family of watchmakers in Holland, in Harlem, Holland as a matter of fact, uh, when the Nazi occupation was taking place. And of course, wherever the Nazis went, Jews were in deep, deep trouble. Papa Ten Boom, Corey's father, was a great supporter of the Jewish people. He realized these are God's chosen people. He said of the Nazis, I pity them, for they have touched the apple of God's eye. He was so much in sympathy with the Jews that when the edict came down that they were to wear those armbands distinguishing them as Jews, he got him one. <laughs> And he wore it, even though he was not a Jew. In his sol solidarity with the Jews, he wore one of those armbands. And uh, so that's the kind of family that this was. They supported the Jews and tried to help them. Now, here's what they did. Uh, their, their home was built like this. It was a two-story home. The first floor was the, the uh, watch shop, the clock shop. And then on the second floor, that's where the family lived. If you were able to go on uh, the, the Internet, I would strongly suggest that you go to just simply Corey Den Ten Boom, CoreyTenBoom.com, and then if you'll find exhibits, uh, it will take you to a page where you can look at these things that I'm talking about right now. The, that house now, that home, has been turned into a museum and people come there. But anyway, uh, their home was built like that. The, the clock shop was on the first floor, and he had a number of employees, plus the family worked with him. And uh, on the second floor was where they lived, and then uh, uh, as they began to try to do their part to help Jews that were trying to flee from the Nazis, uh, they became one of those way stations for Jews. They would come there and stay until they were able to move along to, some, to the next place and the next place until they were able to escape to freedom. In that home on the second floor where they lived, there is today, if you go to that website I'm talking about, there's a hole in the wall. And that hole in the wall, you could go through it and there's steps that lead up to the attic and that's where the Jews hid. And then in the evenings, they'd draw all the drapes, they'd move that piece of furniture away from the hole in the wall. The Jews would come down and they'd all sit around the family dining table and have dinner together. And uh, this went on and on for a while. They were helping so many Jews to escape. And uh, then, unfortunately, they were found out. Once they were found out, the whole family was taken captive. The uh, family went all the family went into captivity. They were all arrested by the Nazis. Uh, Papa Ten Boom, he only lasted 10 days after being arrested. He was old and frail at that time, and he only lasted 10 days before he passed. All the family died 
in Nazi concentration camps or in captivity, except for Corey. Corey and her older sister, Betsy, were able to stay together and were in various places that the Nazis took them. They finally ended up in Ravensbrück concentration camp for women, and there they were together, went through horrible, horrible treatment, vile treatment, uh, but all through that, Corey's sister, Betsy, maintained a Christian witness like, uh, it, it was just incredible. See the movie, read the book, you'll understand what I'm getting emotional about. But she put forth a, a tremendous Christian witness right there in that concentration camp. And she would say to Corey, Corey, don't hate, don't hate, don't hate. And, and so anyway, time went by in that concentration camp and uh, through the maltreatment and so forth that they uh, received, Betsy died. By a clerical error, I like to think of it more as God's hand, uh, Corey was released, and it was just after she was released that women her age and older were all executed. They were all annihilated. Then uh, she got free, and she spent the rest of her life, after the war, she spent the rest of her life going around teaching, uh, of course, the gospel, but also teaching specifically about forgiveness, about forgiving. Now, the name of her book is the hiding place. Now, you say, well, the hiding place, that was the place where the Jews hid in the attic, that hole in the wall that led up to where the Jewish people were hidden. Well, in one sense, that's true. That was a hiding place. But friend, that is not the true meaning of the book that she wrote. The true meaning of the book that she wrote, The Hiding Place, had to do with that hiding place that God is to all of us who take refuge in Him. And uh, one of the things that she said that has stuck with me, and I'll try to quote it verbatim, uh, I've used this many times, she said, no matter how deep the pit, His love is deeper still. And so, my dear friend, listen, the hiding place is about the hiding place for the Jews, but it's more about the hiding place that God is for all of us. That's what the Ten Boom family found out. That's what Corey wrote about, the hiding place. But thousands of years before that, someone else had already discovered that hiding place, and that was King David of Israel. And I'm going to look now at the Psalms. And I'm going to look at Psalm 32 and read verse 7 for us. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. <laughs> That's David. David had discovered way before Corey Ten Boom and all the rest of us, that God is the true hiding place. Let's just think about David's life. And excuse me if this review is a little tedious for some of you. I don't think it will be. David, of course, was one of the sons of Jesse. He was a shepherd boy. There was a king in Israel, the first king, and that was King Saul. But God spoke to Samuel, the prophet, and told him to go to the house of Jesse, and there he would anoint the new king of Israel. Well, he comes to Jesse's home. He announces his purpose. Jesse brings in all of his big old uh, blustery sons. You know. <laughs> but David is out in the field tending sheep. He's so disregarded, he isn't even brought in to this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> apparently Jesse in his mind just couldn't conceive of David ever being the one that Samuel had come to anoint. But Samuel looked over all these fine lads and said, he's not here, is this all you have? And that's when they thought about old David out there tending the sheep, watching over the sheep. They brought him in. Samuel recognized immediately by the Holy Spirit that's who it was. He anointed David. And David was to become the next king. Now, as we look at David's life, I want you to notice this with me. 
I thought the other day, you know, if you tried to chart David's life, there would, it would be like the saw, a saw blade. It would be up and down, up and down, up and down. But probably a better way to illustrate it would be a roller coaster because in addition to the ups and downs, there were all kinds of twists and turns and dark tunnels and so forth that his life went through. Uh, but David, uh, uh, certainly this was a high point in his life. This was up on the chart, we might say. This was up at the top of the hill for him. He was anointed to be the next king of Israel. Well, time went by, a little time went by. Uh, a war came with the Philistines. His brothers all go off to fight in that war. He goes under his father's instructions to take supplies to his brothers. And when he gets there, he finds out that the armies of Israel are being harassed and, and demeaned by uh, this this ginormous <laughs> Philistine named Goliath. Now, even if you don't know anything at all about the Bible, you know about David and Goliath. So I'm, you know what happened. So David, uh, he volunteers to go fight with this Goliath. No one else wanted to fight him. I mean, this guy was bad-mouthing the Israeli army big time. Nobody wanted to face this big guy. David said he would do it. He has to convince the king that he can. He said, look, king, when I was a shepherd, as a shepherd boy, when bears and lions come to take sheep from the flock, I stand against them. I'll stand against this dog, this Philistine dog. Well, they try the armor of the king on him, and, you know, it didn't fit. He's just a little kid. So he, he picks up five smooth stones for his slingshot, and he goes out, and sure enough, pow, he kills, the, kills Goliath, chops his head off. That was another high. Now, a perk that went along with that victory was he was to marry the king's daughter. Well, this could seem to him to be in the perfect will and plan of God. He's been anointed to be the next king. Maybe this is the avenue he's, he's going to arrive at that position. And so he marries the king's daughter. But you know what? There's such jealousy. Saul has uh, gone against the Lord in several ways, and he finally just ripped it and... and uh, he is so jealous of, of David that he even hurls a javelin, a spear at him at one point. Well, David escapes, and with the help of Saul's son, Jonathan, he escapes and gets away from Saul. He has a little band of men that, that, that follow along with him. Now, look, here we are. You want to call it a roller coaster? You want to call it a, a, a chart? But he's had these ups, and now, boom, he's gone from being a, a hero and the king's son-in-law to being a fugitive. He had several, uh, several opportunities to take vengeance against King Saul, but he never did it. And finally, things get resolved. Saul is killed in a battle, and after a struggle that went on there for power, David finally becomes the king. Well, he's back up on the top of the the roller coaster again. But then he decides he's going to number the people. So he numbers the people. Zoom, down he goes again. Then up he comes again after that incident. About the time he was in his 50s, the armies of Israel go out to war, but he stays back. One day after he's been lounging around the palace, he goes out on the terrace and he looks over at his neighbor's house and there he sees Bathsheba bathing herself. He lusts after her. You know the story. He lusts after her, brings her to the palace, has relations with her, sends her back home. She's found to be with child. What's he going to do? Well, he conspires with his military commander to have her husband, Uriah, lead an attack and then to have the troops withdraw and leave him out there to be killed. Folks, that's murder. Here we go. Down again. David thought he had it all covered up. He brings... Bathsheba makes her his wife so that everybody will think, well, this is a baby just born out of season or so uh, early, so forth. But there was a prophet in the land. <laughs> and the prophet comes and he tells David a little story about a man that had a lamb that uh, was taken by a more powerful man. And David got enraged and said, that man should be killed. <laughs> and he said, thou art that man. So David, here again, is uh, in, a, in a fix. Well, folks, I, I've belabored our, and used a lot of our time talking about these things. Let me just say this. David has found out, and I want to ask you, have you found out? I'm learning that God is our refuge when we're in fear. 
God is our refuge, let me say hiding place when we're in dangers. He's our hiding place when we're in sorrow. I didn't even tell about when David's son, Absalom, went against him and he was in deep sorrow over that and over his death. He is our hiding place regardless of what we go through. God is our hiding place. No matter what may come our way, no matter what people may do to us, dear friend, listen, remember, God is our hiding place. You remember when we were children and uh, you get afraid, get scared? What did you do? I remember going to see uh, the ghost of Frankenstein one time when, when I was a child. And uh, came home and got in bed, and I was so scared. And the rose bushes were rubbing against the, the screen on our windows, and I was just scared to death. Flipped over, and there was my white shirt ironed for church the next morning, and I thought that was the ghost of Frankenstein. You know what I did? <laughs> you do, you've done that too. Well, look, those covers are not going to help you. But you know what? We have a hiding place where we can find security. Uh, I'll tell you what, we need to realize that we serve a God that is able. Uh, back during the days when Princeton Theological Seminary was one where men were taught the scriptures and were taught true doctrine and not all this liberal stuff that goes on today up there, there was a professor by the name of Robert Dick Wilson. And uh, he told his students, uh, when you come back to speak, you know, a lot of times seminaries and uh, Bible schools will have their alumni come back and preach for an assembly. He said, whenever you come to speak, he said, I'm going to come and I'm going to hear you. and I'm going to come and I'll hear you one time and one time only. When I come to hear you speak, it won't be to see if you have learned to be a great speaker. It won't be to come and see if you learn to interpret the scriptures. It will, I will come to see if you are a big godder or a little godder. <laughs> you know, dear people, sometimes we don't even have to speak. We're showing by the way we live, by our reaction to things, whether we believe that we have a big God or a little God. Our God is big. Our God is able, dear friend. We need to understand that he is our hiding place. And we need to go to that hiding place when, when we have a problem, when we have difficulties, when we're in danger or sorrow, when we're in sickness, when we're in sin. You know, David went to God when he was in sin. When that prophet came and shook his finger in his face and said, you're the man, you know where David went? He didn't run away and hide. He went to God. Folk, listen, that's the last place, the last place in our flesh, we want to go. It's the last place that Satan wants us to go is to God when we have sinned. But you know what? That's the first place we should go. David had found out even in sin, he is our hiding place. As a matter of fact, this, sin, this uh, psalm, Psalm 32, this is all about. This is all about him being forgiven. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Look, this whole psalm, and go to Psalm 51 also, these two psalms are, are about going to that hiding place when you have sinned. Now, folk, listen. When we sin, go to God. When we sin, let's get to God as quick as we can. Get to Him as quick as we can. Don't let the enemy keep us have us stand off from God because he's the one that we need to go to when sin has entered into our lives. Yes, we need to know that we've got a big God. But you know what? We also need to know that we have a willing God. Let me just read a few scriptures here. These are scriptures from the Psalms and Proverbs. Listen to Psalm 51, verse 3. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. In Psalm 46, David wrote, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. In uh, 
in Psalm uh, 18, he said this, the, lo the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my Savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, my place of safety. That must have rubbed off on the next generation because in Proverbs, his son Solomon wrote this, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The godly run into it and are safe. Now back in Psalm 46, verse 1, he said that God is a very present help in time of trouble. And the New Living Translation, this is a modern translation that uh, brings, out, brings things over into the way we speak today. Uh, it said this, God is our refuge and strength. Always ready. Always ready. Look, friend. If we're going to have a place of safety, a place of refuge, a, a hiding place, that hiding place has got to be stronger than the storm we're facing. Amen? <laughs> That's God. He's a big God. Believe in a big God. Okay? But not only that, He's willing. It said there, remember, remember what we just read? He's always ready. He's always ready. Several years back, there was a double-page ad for the Jaguar XJ220 automobile. It could uh, travel in excess of over 200 miles an hour. Its price, suggested retail price, was $600,000, not including the CD player. <laughs> but there was a note in the ad that said, due to federal regulation, we are sorry, we will not be able to, you will not be able to enjoy the XJ220 in the United States. We're sorry. That's something you never will hear from God. He doesn't say, I'm sorry, I can't help. He is always ready to help us. Listen, dear one, get it in your head. We serve a big God. Be a big Godder, not a little Godder. And realize that our God is not only able but that our God is agreeable. He's ready to help us. Flee unto God when you're going through difficult times. Are you going through a difficult time right now? Are you? Are things not going the way you think they would go? Remember David, you know, he thought when he married the king's daughter, well, maybe this is probably the way I'll get to be the king. Uh, you know, when you're confused, they're, they're people. You want to talk about somebody being confused. I know what it is to be confused in the Lord's service, believe me. <laughs> but, but you know what? He is our, he's our hiding place in, in all these things, in confusion, in, in fears, in uh, times when we, uh, we go through sorrow in our sickness. I, I had a good friend's wife just this week. Uh, went in the hospital having chest pains, and she had had a heart uh, problem, a uh, problem with her heart, in her heart for years. The doctors, they, we prayed and prayed and prayed. Uh, the doctors looked at her x-rays, looked at her, the, the scan, and her heart had, was back perfectly normal, perfectly normal. Our God's able. He's able. Go to Him. Go to our God. He is able. Now, we're getting close to the end of the broadcast, and, and I want to just pause here for a moment and say a little prayer for you, okay? Just, just, a, just a moment of prayer. Would you bow your head, please? Father, I pray for my friends that are watching or listening to this broadcast right now. And whatever they're going through, I pray that you will cause them to purpose in their heart to go to their hiding place. And Lord, I know you're going to show yourself strong to them in whatever need they have at this time. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, look, we, uh, we have something we like to do on Victory for today, and that is to give Bibles away. If you do not have a Bible, now, this is not just to build up your library. This is if you do not have a Bible. I'll be very happy to send you one. This is from Christ's Way Fellowship. We'd be very happy to send you a Bible. Uh, this is the New King James Version. It's the one that I like to use, and I've used this one for quite a while now. It's got all kinds of notes and scribbles and, and uh, been left in the van and stuff <laughs> overnight. But it's, it's a good sturdy paperback. I'd love to send you a New King James Version. Uh, or you can have the 1984 edition of the New International Version. You can have the King James Version. I'd be glad to send that to you. Uh, or you can have the 
uh, a Spanish Bible. We have Spanish Bibles too. Now along with that, you receive a little brief Bible study that's entitled Beginning Steps. That's a great little study. Whether you're a brand new Christian or you've been around this for a long time, it's still a good study to go through. Uh, mini DVD, which is 20 minutes of excerpts from the gospel film Matthew. There's a little booklet entitled Eternal Life. If you have never been born again by the grace of God, this little booklet will tell you how to be saved. If you are a Christian, I think most of our listeners are, then use this, use this to share with someone else, with a loved one, with a friend. Let them be born again. Show them how to be born again. Be an evangelist. <laughs> and there's another booklet entitled, Have You Made the Wonderful Discovery of the Spirit-Filled Life? Oh, I'd love for you to have that little booklet. It's so helpful. So just write to us. The address is going to be on the screen in just a moment. Or you can go to our website, victoryfortoday.com, and order your Bible through the website. While you're on the website, explore around a little bit. You'll see on the left side of your screen on, on our website, there will be five minutes it'll change, that can change everything. Uh, I suggest you look at that and then go back to the website. And then you'll see the next thing, I believe, is home and then archives. If you click on archives, it'll bring up a, a, a link that you can go to. And that'll bring you to sermons.net. And there's over 200 of these talks and sermons on there. Some in audio. Most of them are audio and video. Some even have uh, my sermon notes. Uh, some of them are from 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So uh, you're welcome. To the, the sound quality may not be as good as those that we're making now. But uh, uh, they're on there, and uh, I hope they'll be helpful to you. Just about any subject that you want to study, prophecy, uh, salvation, books of the Bible, you'll find on that website under uh, archives. Uh, there's other sites you can go to, devotional guides that I like to use. And so I just invite you to go to that website and order uh, that Bible through there too, of course. Uh, these are absolutely free. These Bibles are absolutely free. There's no charge. You won't be added to a mailing list. Uh, so uh, please feel uh, completely comfortable in ordering your Bible. Uh, we are a listener-supported program, so if you feel led to become part of our support team, just send your gift to that same address that you'll find on your screen. Sorry, we don't have a way for you to give over the website. You'll need to just send your check in uh, to that website or to that address. Well, this is Wayne Duncan saying it's been great to be with you. The good Lord willing and the saints don't rise. I'll see you right here next week on Victory for Today.